the chef thing is very cloying on top chef where they all call each yeah, other chef. chef and then they're calling Tom Colicchio chef. It's like, when was the last time he cooked anything? Come on. hundred percent. Yeah. I don't think that's an honorific. It's like what you do for a living, right? Yeah. Okay, so you were, so, yes, yeah, so what were we talking about? Yeah, so definition. So President Biden, this was prompted by two things. One is this ongoing discussion in healthcare about what the definition of charity care and community benefit is. And then as this is an ongoing theme within our industry, and we're hearing, we're having conversations about it, then here's this prime non-healthcare example of what the hell is a recession? Are we in a recession or not? And the president, his team, very understandably saying, look, we get the numbers, but we're not in a recession. And people saying, well, yeah, but technically. So what the issue wasn't that anybody is necessarily wrong on the technical details of these words, but that you're spending so much time trying to parse it out and convince people that, well, if you look really deep on the spreadsheet, these numbers indicate that, well, it's like, no, charity care is when somebody can't pay to go to the ER and you write that off. It seems like a, it feels like a pretty straightforward definition or a recession, which has more technical things. But it, in a lot of ways, it does feel to some like we are in, like the economy is going in the wrong direction. And so how you talk about those words matters. Yes. Oh, well, I think that's right. I think there's also, I, I mean, I think there are layers to this, which is convenient because we're talking about it right now. So that would be we need layers. less convenient <laughs> if there was just one thing. And Kim and Tim returns the three minute. Yeah. <laughs> 35 seconds. But like, you know, there's different things here. So the, the recession thing, I'm not an economist. I have a bachelor's <laughs> in English. So not an economist. Don't really know or. But you know words. At this moment, much care about the definition of a recession. I understand what people were saying two weeks ago where it felt like things were tracking in some direction. There's job reports that this week that seem different. I don't know what the tipping point for a recession is. In that instance, I do think there's a difference between me th saying it's a recession or pundits saying it's a recession and obviously the president of the, the United, United States, States saying yeah. it's a recession because the economy Implications. is... is volatile and dependent on humans to some extent. And the president saying that has ripple effects that I can understand why he would not necessarily be jumping in politics aside. It can be one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. I understand that. I think it's more interesting why we push for these things, like why we need it so badly, why we need to call the thing that it's certainly one thing for economists to be tracking recessions and the economy over time for me or for you or for anyone. Okay. We've got these signifiers. I know things are more expensive. I'm paying more for gas, inflation, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure that I benefit in my day-to-day -day life from having that name. I, I think I agree with, I mean, I agree that there's a difference between president Biden saying the word and everybody else saying the words. I get it. Cause it does have implications. I do disagree a little bit that we, that as humans, we like things named something. For example, if you think we're in healthcare, if I, if I have something that's not right with me physically, it makes me feel better to have it named, right? And to know that, oh, I have that thing and now I know what to do about that thing. Or it makes us feel better that we're not alone or that I'm not feeling this way because I'm there's something wrong with me in my head. It's, oh, I have a diagnosis. And that diagnosis helps me feel a certain way. So I think in some cases, words are very important for us to, to feel and understand and be or whatever. Um, I think we overuse th those things sometimes to justify things. But I do think words have meaning and who says them has implications and meaning as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I, and a less... Or another example that is among my own personal hobby horses and is much less important, but to the Cubs, the oh, Chicago Cubs, they play baseball. Just to predict, uh, I was going to say, everybody, this is a baseball reference, and I couldn't quite get my mouth open yeah. in time. So Cruises the Chicago Cubs are a baseball team, and they <laughs> have, have spent the last two years trading all their most beloved players 
losing much more than they had in the previous five or six years. And earlier this season, there was like a consistent conversation for two weeks around whether or not Jed Hoyer, the president of baseball operations for the Cubs, would call this process a rebuild. And it seemed like (laughs) it was like a stalemate where people are like, is it a rebuild? And he's, I don't know what that means. It's like, what? Yes, you do. What are you talking about? But I, I get what you're saying. And he'll, so it would be like, is it a rebuild? And he'd say, we're trying to build the next great Cubs team. And we go, but would you call it a rebuild? And he's, I'm trying to build the next great Cubs team. <laughs> and it's like, I, like on there. both ends of it, I don't understand. The negative value for Jed Hoyer to say, yeah, we're rebuilding, but we're going to hope it's quick. We hope to be better next year and really good in a couple of years. That's what everyone sees. Everyone watches the team. People who care about this are aware of what's happening. There's no real loss in saying, yeah, we're rebuilding, but it's going to be a quick rebuild. You know, we're going to patch the roof or whatever, you know, whatever metaphor you <laughs> want to use. On the other end of it, I never understood why it was so important for the people who are like, will you say it's a rebuild? <laughs> So or, they're 20 games under 500. They're giving away all their players. That's what it is. Like, or you can be Nick Saban and say that he had a rebuilding year last year because they didn't win the national championship. <laughs> that's a higher class problem. But that's where, and so to your point on talking points, like that is clear. Mm-hmm. And we, as we move into the charity care part of this, we have some responsibility in our role in the world for what has what this has wrought. Because we have do our media training, we do our message training, we tell people to pivot back to the message that they want to deliver, mm-hmm. they tell people to bridge from the question they don't want to answer to the, to the answer they want to We're give, and secrets. that's what these people are doing. I don't know what a rebuild is, but I'm building the next great Cubs team. It's well, just give me a break. This isn't that important. And you could just answer the question. But people have been too successfully message trained mm-hmm. in positions that face the public generally. Kim is someone who does message training workshops. You know, he's giving away our, our trade secrets. We'll make this a paid yeah. podcast. Bridge, bridging and building. Design. Hey, those are bridging Nobody, and building are my favorite things. Bridging nobody's back to ever the, heard of bridging until this. Before now when they it is the best thing ever. Hour. It works with your spouse. It works with your kids. It works with, right? It just, it's, you're going to bridge back to the message that you want to share. Oh, my marriage is so much stronger since I started working at Gerard. Because of message. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it does work. It does work. Yeah, and did it, you it, acknowledge it, the question? Yes, That's it, a great question. Yeah. It does work. I, I just think if you're looking at sports and how we all love sports different degrees. So it's like, it's sports. Right. Eh, like I shrug my shoulders. Let's not get too worried about it. But I think why we care so much about sports is because we don't want to hear the, all the other stuff. I can lose myself in sports because it's not recession talk. It is not talk about whether or not the presidency is real or not. It is not talking about the terrible things happening in the Ukraine. And I can focus my attention on something that really at the end of the day, it matters to me, but it's not the, it's, it's sports. Right. And so in but to I the can, point I, of definitions, there's a winner and a loser, right? That, like it's, it's a yeah, defined, yep. there's a defined outcome. There's right. comfort in that. Yes, there is comfort in that and solidness to it. And I'll get over it in three or four days and then move on with my life. But it's easy to love that because everything else is so muddy. And that's why I think we were talking about words Using vague, muddy words is not super helpful a lot of times. And I, I think as from a pe- perspective of a woman, we use vague, muddy words all the time to protect ourselves or to make, make us seem less assertive, right? So in conversations, rather than saying, rather than delegating, okay, here's what I want you to do. It's this of, all right, who in the room wants to take the first stab? And you stare around the room and instead of being clear about, all right, we got to get this done. And all right, so Mary, you take the first stab at that. I'll take this. Instead of being real clear about delegating, we just, we dance around the issue or we say the word sort of, or almost, or use vague words like that so that we don't appear to be too harsh. It's a woman thing that we have to overcome a lot so that we don't seem so decisive. And then, it's, then it basically is completely unclear. <laughs> no one, everybody leaves the room going, now, who was, who was doing that? Was that me? So it actually it hurts you in the way you're trying to deflect or be less abrasive. And it just causes confusion. That's a great point. I think that's a, it's a great point on how individuals, and particularly women, have to move through 
professional settings in the world, not always hospitable to um, you all. It, like how we then bring that up higher. The position of the person, the position of the speaker, the position of the organization is significant. And what I was thinking about when you were talking about the muddying is the charity care piece that we, mm-hmm. we mentioned earlier, because I think that's a very muddy area for really good reasons. Because yeah, I, think Dave, Dave, I think you said earlier that charity care should be a clear thing. Like it's care we provide to people without insurance or whatever. And I think that's fair. I also think that if you are a health system, the amount of impact or the level of financial resourcing that you are dedicating to the community is expansive beyond that definition of care. And so I get the impulse to say, okay, so what we call charity care is certainly care that we just don't get paid for, Mm -hmm. but also care where we're under reimbursed mm. or care where the med- like Medicaid care as a percentage of what it would really cost. I uh, think it is very muddy. Mm-hmm. And I also think that, and we've talked about this in other contexts, but hospitals and health systems don't do a good job of accounting for this stuff. They don't do a good job of talking about it. They don't do a good job of most things that involve financial issues that impact people. But I do think that there's there's an umbrella of what some systems call charity care that is actually an amount of money that is less than what they would normally get for things that they're putting out. If they're putting out a billion dollars in all of these categories, I think it's important for them to be able to talk to that mm-hmm. in a way that is clearer because there are a bunch, you know, insurance companies for example, don't have that burden of proof. They do not. Can we not find a common definition as an industry of what charity care is? That would clear up a lot of problems, like a definition of what that means that all use the same definition. Way back in the day, I'm going having a way back in the day conversations today. I was responsible for gathering all of the stuff for the 990s on our community service. And that was unclear. So health fairs that you did in the community, where you're going out and doing blood pressures and giving health information out, we had to quantify that because that is part of charity care and community benefit. And so defining those and, okay, how many nurses did we take and how much do they cost per hour? How many of these things did we do? Did we, do, did we have the mammo machine come? All of the, Trying to calculate all of that. It wasn't, let's just be honest, I calculated those with my English brain. <laughs> you have a master's too. so Yes, sure. but not with anything related yeah, to math. Yeah. So anyway, some of that stuff is you don't know how to define it. So you just, you try to do that. Yeah. Try to do it the best you can. Be consistent. Just be consistent about it. But these, th- there, it wasn't defined then and it's not defined. And how many years ago was that? 20 years probably. And we still don't know how to quantify the care that we give that's not compensated. That seems so simple to me. So then, Kim, so what's the first step? Is it that somebody at a hospital or health system just starts, just comes out and says, here's what we're doing, here's what we're not doing, here's how we are defining this, and then everybody goes, oh, that's a pretty good idea, and they fall in line? Or is this a, that the top five health system executives call the guys over at the Aetna and Cigna and Blue Cross offices and say, let's spend a weekend in Jackson Hole? And play well, I think some golf isn't it somewhat defined by the IRS? Is, that would be my I, I, assumption. I think there is a regulatory but, definition too, but clearly that's not, not working good because yeah, that's it's not working out. Because you got to think about also the uh, for academics the research piece too. Right? How much money is put into research that's not that doesn't come back to you and they come back in other ways, yeah. right? We don't do a, as Tim just mentioned, do a good job of communicating what that is, because once again, you know what the problem is. Healthcare is complicated and it takes hours to explain or longer than the attention span that people have of seven seconds. Yeah. So how do you explain your benefit to the community outside of the care you provide or within it? How do you define that in an easy, easy way? Because it is is a little tricky. You talk about the under, under reimbursed. What is, what does that mean to the average person? Well, Medicaid only pays well, us. You also, know, what? Huh? You're like, you're, you've lost people. Go ahead. Sorry. You guys are a little choppy on my end. So as long as you can hear me, fine. But um, You sound great, Tim. What I was going to say to your 
point there. Great. Th- thank you. Thank you. Is that the other part that we, you, we had talked about or that you prompted in the quick think is burnout. And I think burnout mm-hmm. is shows the limitations of defining something. And so like, while we say people want to have a name for something. We want to, we want to mm. hang. That's a really good point. We're feeling all a certain way about the economy. So we want to hang it all on this term recession. We've seen the limits over the last mm. couple of years of hanging everything on one word and being like, well, this is burnout. Big problem is clinician burnout. Problem, <laughs> the problem for health systems is nurses are burnt out. And that becomes a alienating thing for the people involved because they're like, it's a lot more nuanced than that. It's not that I'm feeling a little tired at the end of the day or that I'm feeling a little fried by my work. It's a, the what you're describing is the collision of 15 negative things that are happening to me every day. Yep. And so instead of addressing any of those things, we just say, Ooh, everyone's just, burnt, burnt out. out. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. This burnout word has been thrown around so much, just like a lot of words, but but no one can really say what that means. And, cer- and certainly people don't know what to do about it. Well, and it feels evasive, I think, mm. in some degree. Okay? Hey, nurses, we know you're burnt out. So here is a $50 Starbucks gift card. It's like, okay, no, I'm telling you what my actual issues are. And it's, you know, everything from pay to scheduling to how we're treated in the workplace. But you're saying burnout. And then throwing it, like throwing me something to make me feel better and not addressing the actual things that are contributing to your headline. I think it's a word we use because we don't know how else to describe what's going on in our heads. Whether it's frustration, irritation, burnout, whatever, we can't even describe how we're feeling ourselves. I can't. And mental health professionals are probably struggling with that. How, like, wh- how do I describe what is what I'm feeling in a way that you can understand because I don't even know what it is that is, uh, we can't describe the weight that we feel because it's just, it's so many things. How do you pull one thing and say, that would go away in my life. I wouldn't feel this way in in this time. Can't even describe what that is or delve into your own feelings about it. But we need to do better with all of this. We need to try. (laughs) So what's the first step in trying? Is it, as you're talking, Kim, is it just slowing down a little bit and saying we can't fully describe, we don't have the words to describe what's taking place within this umbrella of burnout, Mm -hmm. or we can't fully capture the economic pressure that people are feeling regardless of whether or not we're in a recession. But here is as specifically as we can, what we are seeing or experiencing. Is it slowing down? What do you, what do you do to at least begin to Is it enough to try to explain what it is or should we do something about it? I I, I hear that, as Tim said, here's a $50 gift card to get some Starbucks. So what if we tried to, so we can't fully express or understand where we are, all are. What if we try this? Let's see if that helps. An action item, right? So whether it's a scheduling thing or whatever it is, I'm not a nurse, so I don't know their lives but are there things we can take, actions that we can take that say, I hear you, I don't know exactly how to help you, but let's, how about we try this together? Or do you have a suggestion that might alleviate some stress? Maybe that's the conversation to have rather than trying to define what burnout is, is trying to tackle the actual problem. Maybe, maybe even attack the symptoms themselves, something. Because I don't know that we know how to solve any of this, to tell you the truth. Well, I think in both of these healthcare-specific examples, like shift what you said, something about specific. I think specificity, and to your what you're saying, Kim, like specificity is key. Even if there's smaller, discrete gestures Mm -hmm. and investments that we're making, being specific over platitudes, I think just people at this point are burnt out. (laughs) See what I did there? God. On, on platitudes and on big picture stuff. And so that's where you tune out charity care because, okay, I'm that's all fuzzy. It's all made up, but we can tell specific stories. I think mm. systems that have community benefit reports that really come alive, that are not just some 12 page report that has a bunch of numbers, but that invest in thinking about how to have the people and programs come to life through video and whatever else, get specific stories in that space and be able to, and use those to tell your bigger picture instead of starting big 
and then hoping that people dig down, tell the smaller stories and, and hope th- that, and weave them together into a larger narrative. And another thing, rather, I think stories are always wonderful. I think tr- tr- not only tell specific stories, but tackle specific things. You can't solve the fact that there are people without insurance that can't get the health care they need. People with diabetes that can't get the drugs. We can have a whole conversation about that thing. But what we can do is tackle something. I sometimes tell my clients that what do you want to own, right? So we all do community health benefit assessments, the China's, the needs assessments in our communities. We have to do that every three years. So what is it that you've identified in your community that is a problem? Why don't try to tackle that one thing? to make a difference with that one thing, whether it's lack of mental health services in your community or childhood obesity, or is smoking a big deal in your state or your community? Can you identify those things and try to tackle that very specifically and make a dent in that because you can't change everything. I have a client out West that they have identified three things to tackle. And one of those is uh, unaffordable housing right? The fact that their their nurses can't even afford to live in the communities that they're working. So they're committed to tackling that. That's not a necessarily, quote, a, quote, healthcare issue, but they've identified, identified it as a huge problem. And so they're tackling three things rather than trying to change the world. Just like using specific words, take on specific issues, whether it's with your in your own facility with your nurses, the specific issues that are causing stress, specific issues in your community, like tackle... You can't fix everything, but man, you could fix one thing. And I think that's, and I'll give a brief plug to our own work and something that Schiff and I spent a lot of time on over the last month was our, the gun violence mm-hmm. resources that are up on our website and on charters. And, that, and that's exactly the path that we took in this, like this most recent gun massacre in Texas. It's no longer the most recent, but it was at the time happens and we all want to do something. And so when we're, you know, we have this meeting with our colleagues at Chartist and we're trying to figure out where we can enter this conversation meaningfully, even if it's at the smallest margins, we're not, I'm not able to go around the country taking these guns from people, although if given the opportunity, um, but what we can do is influence how our health systems are prepared for when this inevitably strikes close to home and it's not changing the world. But it may help change like one small corner of Mm -hmm. the world that we can influence. And it felt good to be able to do that. It felt good to be able to think through that and think through how this, how we can have whatever impact we can have. And that was a very specific, discreet tool that we offered up and that's available on our website. And I think that the specificity is key there. I just, I really do feel like in a lot of the work that we see, a lot of our clients now who are stretched really thin Mm. the the reliance on big picture platitudes just is no longer really effective it's no longer you know you don't really have the benefit of the doubt as a health system you don't have benefit of the doubt as an institution in america right now Mm. and you have to work a little harder to tell the story of those specific individual like projects and actions and then build a broader narrative that ties those together Kim, last word, if you want it. I agree. Um, I don't like the phrase building a broader narrative, though. Okay. Can we say, I think just telling the wonderful story that you have. You know, like narrative is, I feel like narrative is an overused word right now. It is a narrative. That narrative. I I fell back on my own platitude there. Thank you, Kim, for that constructive (laughs) real-time criticism of my own point. (laughs) I appreciate you. And yeah, no, I, well, the narr- I you're right. I, we should just not say narrative anymore. It is like one of those, we're in a real narrative moment. People we love are. talking narratives. Yep. Don't boil the ocean. <laughs> Man, I don't know how to top that. So I'm just going to sail off into the sunset. Good enough. <laughs>